We are listening to the sound of a call to prayer, quite a typical sound to be heard in any Islamic city. But specifically, we are in Damascus, the heart of medieval Syrian syncretism, at the Umayyad Mosque. Highlighting Syria's history of Islamo-Christian interaction, this mosque was built on the grounds of a former basilica dedicated to St. John the Baptist, and still today there are relics of St. John within the building's walls. Further interfaith activity here occurred in 2001, when Pope John Paul II visited the relics and became the first known pope to enter a mosque. Adjacent to this grand statement of religious interaction is the tomb of Saladin, the founder of the Sunni Ayyubid dynasty in 1171, which became known for its tolerance of infidels despite ongoing crusades. One of the most fascinating artifacts highlighting the dynamic religiosity of the era comes almost a century later, when the last Ayyubid Sultan, Al-Malik Al-Sali Ayyub, commissioned the object of this program, a large and exquisitely decorated basin, crafted around the year 1247. Pre-modern worlds, a history through objects. Ayyubid Basin, 13th century, made of brass and laid with silver. In Damascus, there are very many churches both of Catholics and of heretics, and monasteries full of grace. Of these, the Saracens have taken one fair church to be a church for themselves. On the front of this church, God's majesty still remains nobly painted. That was a medieval account of Damascus by German priest Ludolf von Sudheim from slightly after the Ayyubid era. But the mosque described within contains an almost identical motif as our basin, through their mutual blending of the seemingly incongruous cultures of Christianity and Islam. Our object, sitting in the Freer Gallery of Art, is notably labeled From Syria to France, which is just one of the many indications of a remarkably complex history contained within. The basin is fairly large, perhaps a bit bigger than a bathroom sink. The bottom of it is smaller than the top, as it gradually branches out and creates a lip overhanging the top edge. Made of brass and inlaid silver, this object gives off a shimmer through its duality of colors, with the actual image depictions and calligraphy mainly consisting of the silver sections. The depictions themselves vary greatly in topic, specifically between religious themes. The two, the, the Muslims, and, and actually there are also um, you know, we know that there was also a Jewish community, so they all sort of work together, which is, which is um, really um, sort of interesting. And it's, it's something that you can really tell with these objects. I mean, you can tell from historical sources, but you can also tell from these visual sources. This person was, was interested or had an interest, or it could be a Christian and he's being addressed in that, in the, in that yeah. way. So they're, just the way that the decoration itself combines these different traditions and this, these different um, craftsmen coming together and working, the messages, whether it's the visual one or the, the written one, are also sort of layered. That was Freer Gallery curator Dr. Masume Farhad on the religious interactions at the time that are represented in our object, which carries both Christian and Muslim themes. The Islamic heritage of the basin is very apparent, but it is invoked most visibly in the central band on the exterior, where a group of horsemen are playing polo. Polo, at the time, was a key aspect of Ayyubid court culture, especially because it was the Sultan's preferred sport. A polo grounds was even constructed during his nine-year reign in Cairo, the capital of the empire. The accompanying floral scroll work and various animals, both real and mythical, which are scattered around the design, are also generally typical of Ayyubid decorative features. The bottom of the basin, though damaged and worn, also still shows the remains of an Islamic-influenced design, 
with faded musicians playing flutes, tambourines, lutes, and lyres, all reminiscent of high Islamic court culture. Some depictions even borrow from earlier traditions, specifically Persia. Here is Dr. Farhad again on the object's connection to the Shahnameh, or Book of Kings, written about Persia's history and Islam's entrance into its society, and featuring such protagonists as Alexander the Great. Editor's Note Before we dive into this anecdote about the Shahnameh, I would like to clarify that this story has no direct relation to the basin. The cultural images referenced, such as the Wakwak tree, were simply motifs used in both Arab and Persian art, without one necessarily influencing the other. Here is Dr. Farad. So I, I don't know if you, if, you, if you heard, if you read on your, the story of Alexander. Alexander, at the, um, you know, looking for immortality in, mm -hmm. in the shop. So he goes to the end of the world and um, encounters the talking tree. Mm -hmm. And so it's this tree with these animal um, faces and they ask, you know, how do I get immortality? And they say, we all die. Um, so if, when you, if you look at these medallions, you see those lobed medallions, there's one, two. If you look, look carefully, there, there's sort of the scroll work and then there are these faces. And that is supposed, that is a reference to this um, talking tree. It's called the Wak Wak tree, W-A-Q, W-A-Q. Um, so that again is a reference to, you know, the sort of the Persian Islamic tradition. Most obviously Islamic to the common viewer, however, is perhaps the elegant Arabic calligraphy that wraps around the top of the object's interior and exterior sections. All of the writing, varied in stylized script from plated kufic to thuluth, writes of one figure, the Sultan. The outside roughly translates as follows. Glory to our master, the Sultan al-Malak al-Shalif, the Lord, the illustrious, the learned, the efficient, the defender of the faith, the warrior of the frontiers, the victor. The inside of the basin makes similar boasts of al-Malik al-Sali, but notably includes his title of Caliph, which was invested upon him around 1247. All of this not only passively mentions Islam, but directly invokes the basin's patron as the protector of the faith and as a successor to Muhammad at a time when crusades rumbled on across the Middle East. Clearly thus far, this is an Islamic object. The basin presents Islamic activities, references Islamic traditions, and boldly praises an Islamic sultan who intended to protect the Holy Land from infidel crusaders. A further inspection, however, complicates this clear-cut idea. Wrapping around the exterior of the basin in separate medallions above the Islamic court's polo game is, strangely, the story of Jesus Christ. In five separate scenes, Jesus' life is depicted through the Annunciation, the Adoration, the Raising of Lazarus, the Entry into Jerusalem, and a final episode probably referencing the Last Supper. Furthermore, the interior of the object contains a total of 39 saints standing under separate arches that wrap around the entire cylinder. These figures aren't individually recognizable, but they are very clearly Christian, with halos, robes, bare heads, and an overall Byzantine-esque appearance. Editor's note. Upon review of this podcast, it occurred to me that some of the discussion about Christian imagery on the object was misleadingly crusade-centric. I would like to clarify that the presence of Christianity in the region, and this object, weren't necessarily the product of religious wars, as Christians had lived under the Ayyubids and other Islamic dynasties for centuries. This isn't the only object with al-Malik al-Sali's name that includes Christian imagery either, as one of the three other artifacts known to bear his name, a brass tray at the Louvre, also shows scenes of Christ. So why did a highly prominent sultan, who fought with and even later died to infidels in the Crusades, commission pieces that so elegantly combined his own religion and favorite activities with that of his general enemies? 
Our answer might come from diplomacy and tolerance. By the year 1240, Al-Malik al-Sali, like many Ayyubid sultans, was facing internal family rivalries, and so sought to take a break from being, as the basin says, warrior of the frontiers, so he could return to Cairo and handle the situation. Contrary to general understandings, diplomacy between the opposing sides of the Crusades did occur, and our Sultan took this occasion to draft a treaty with Theobald I, King of Navarre. Accompanying any sort of alliance at the time would, of course, be gifts. So some historians suggest that this basin was commissioned as one of them. It would, after all, be the perfect diplomatic gift, one that both makes sure to praise oneself and depict one's favorite activity, as well as show honor, universality, and ecumenism to the Christian king to which it would be bestowed. Overall, this is a display of the continued tolerance of the Ayyubid Sultanate, considering that the choice was carefully made to actually invoke religion in a piece that commemorated the temporary bridging of a very touchy religious divide. The Sultan probably even employed the help of Christian artisans who populated cities like Damascus and Cairo in formidable numbers. Interesting though, and showing once more the melding of cultures in the basin's creation, is the fact that Jesus' story is told counterclockwise, meaning that it would follow the traditional Arabic concept of a right-to-left narrative. Regardless, the object's journey of cultural and religious syncretism did not end with its creation or with a diplomatic act. We now travel through space and time to 18th century France. Somehow, and in some way, through trade or inheritance or other means, our object ended up in the possession of the French Borneol family, whose members were counts of Dauphine, Nervenay, Normandy, and Provence. We know this because of their coat of arms, which is etched into the bottom exterior. Included with their shield is some Latin, which recalls a similar classic rivalry to the Islam-Christianity dynamic of the Crusades the English-French rivalry of centuries. It translates as follows. Now that the English enemy is beaten, the bull from the lineage of St. Luke does not bear the yoke of the English rose. He only bears the sweet yoke of Christ. Referencing their bovine-centric coat of arms, the Borgnols once again bring an invocation of Christ to an object of technical Islamic origin. These high society Catholics also probably began to use the basin in a very Catholic manner instead of traditionally as a display piece. Here is Dr. Farhad again. There's a coat of arms, you know, it was, it, it came here um, uh, from France and one of the suggestion is that in this French family it was used for baptism mm -hmm. and there's a very famous one um, that is in Paris, a similar one, that is called the Baptistière. So we know that it was used for baptism. So, and, and many of these um, objects moved, you know, from, I mean, through trade and etc., from the Middle East to either Italy or France and sort of used for special, um, special functions. So yes, it could have been used for, for you know, baptism. It's certainly large enough, grand enough, so functions, functions do change. With that, we come to the object's eventual donation to the Freer Gallery and the conclusion of its active historical journey. This remarkable piece seems to accomplish so much, bridging both cultural and deep religious rifts through its elegant depictions and history of ownership. History is not black and white. Not even the seemingly easy to comprehend Islamo Christian dynamics of the Crusades. After all, if it was, this object would certainly not exist. From the story of Alexander and the Shahnameh, to the Christian story of Jesus Christ, and from the leisurely Ayyubid court culture to Catholic baptisms, this simple basin ties together and synthesizes a new and more connected understanding 
of medieval history and interactions between otherwise strictly opposing ideologies. This is an artifact whose importance leads a viewer to think, to discuss with others about its significance and possibly reframe understandings of the past. I'll leave you with some words from Dr. Farhad. And again, it's you know it's all sort of part of part of the aesthetics of, of, of an object and how to use an object. You know, it's not just an object that you put on a table. I mean, and, yeah, and these are these are special objects, you know. But but it's it's something that sort of engages you. The same with using poetry on objects is is something that again you can you can think about, you can discuss as you're drinking, as you're talking. You know, it's it's it, it sort of becomes. Um, uh, it, it becomes more than just an object. An otherwise potentially overlooked basin that engages the viewer in an extraordinary way. This has been Pre-Modern Worlds, A History Through Objects. Thank you for listening. Yeah.